Chapter Fifteen of Nobody's Man by E. Phillips Oppenheim. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Fifteen. Tallent found himself possessed of a haunting, almost a morbid feeling that a lifetime had passed since last his car had turned out of the station gates and he had seen the moorland unroll itself before his eyes there was a new pungency in the autumn air an unaccustomed scantiness in the herbage of the moor and the low hedges growing from the top of the stone walls the glory of the heather had passed though here and there a clump of brilliant yellow gorse remained the telegraph posts leaning away from the wind seemed somehow scantier the road stretched between them lonely and desolate from a farmhouse in the bosom of the tree-hung hills lights were already twinkling and when he reached the edge of the moor and the sea spread itself out almost at his feet the shapes of the passing steamers with their long trail of smoke were blurred and uncertain below his home field his wall enclosed patch of kitchen garden the long low house itself lay like pieces from a child's play-box stretched out upon the carpet only to-night there was no mist they made their cautious way downwards through the clearest of darkening atmospheres on the hillsides as they dropped down they could hear the music of an occasional sheep bell rabbits scurried away from the headlights of the car an early owl flew hooting over their heads Talent tired with his journey perhaps a little worn with the excitement of the last two months found something dark and a little lonely about the unoccupied house something a little dreary in his solitary dinner and the long evening spent with no company save his books and his pipe later on he lay for long awake watching the twin lights flash out across the channel and listening to the melancholy call of the owls as they swept back and forth across the lawn to their secret abodes in the cliffs when at last he slept however he slept soundly an unlooked-for gleam of sunshine and the dull roar of the incoming tide breaking upon the beach below woke him the next morning long after his usual hour he bathed shaved in front of the open window and breakfasted with an absolute renewal of his fuller interest in life it was not until he had sent back the car in which he had driven as far as the station and was swinging on foot across woolhanger moor that he realized fully why he had come why he had schemed for these two days out of a life packed with multifarious tasks then he laughed at himself heartily yet a little self-consciously a fool's errand might yet be a pleasant one even though his immediate surroundings seemed to mock the sound of his mirth. Woolhanger Moor, in November, was a dreary enough sight. There were many patches of black mud and stagnant water, carpets of treacherous-looking green moss, bare clumps of bushes bent all one way by the northwest wind, masses of rock, gaunter and sterner now that their summer covering of creeping shrubs and bracken had lost their foliage it was indeed the month of desolation every scrap of colour seemed to have faded from the dripping wet landscape phantasmal clouds of grey mist brooded here and there in the hollows the distant hills were wreathed in vapour so that even the green of the pastures was invisible every now and then a snipe started up from one of the weedy places with his shrill mournful cry and more than once a solitary hawk hovered for a few minutes above his head the only other sign of life was a black speck in the distance a speck which came nearer and nearer until he paused to watch it standing upon a little incline and looking steadily along the rude cart track the speck grew in size a person on horseback a woman soon she swung her horse around as though she recognized him jumped a little dyke to reach him the quicker and reined up her horse by his side holding one hand down to him mr tallente she exclaimed how wonderful he held her hand looking steadfastly almost eagerly up into her flushed face her eyes were filled with pleasure 
his errand in those few breathless moments seemed no longer the errand of a fool i can't realize it even now she went on drawing her hand away at last i pictured you at westminster in committee rooms and all sorts of places aren't you forging weapons to drive us from our homes and portion out our savings i have left the thunderbolts alone for one short weekend he answered i felt a hunger for this moorland air london becomes so enveloping jane sat upright upon her horse and looked at him with a mocking smile how ungallant i hope you had come to atone for your neglect have i neglected you he asked quietly turning and walking by her side shockingly you lunched with me on the seventh of august i see you again on the second of november and i do believe that i shall have to save you from starvation again it's quite true he admitted i have a sandwich in my pocket though in case you were away from home worse than ever she sighed you didn't even trouble to make inquiries from whom should i robert my servant his wife and a boy to help in the garden are all my present staff at the manor robert drives the car and waits on me and his wife cooks they are estimable people but i don't think they are up in local news you are quite safe she said looking ahead of her i am never away the tail end of a scat of rain beat on their faces from the hollow on their left the wind came booming up i should have thought that for these few months just now he suggested you might have cared for a change i have my work here such as it is she answered a little listlessly if i were in town for instance i should have nothing to do you must sometimes feel the need of society down here i doubt whether i should meet the people who would interest me she replied and in any case i have my work here that keeps me occupied they turned into the avenue and soon the long front of the house spread itself out before them jane who had been momentarily absorbed looked down at her companion you are alone at the manor she asked quite alone she became the hostess directly they had passed the portals of the house she led him across the hall into her little sanctum this is the room she told him in which i never do a stroke of work sacred to the frivolities alone i shall send morton in to see what you will have to drink while i change my habit you must have something after that walk i shan't be long for the second time she avoided meeting his eyes as she left the room Talent stood on the hearth-rug still looking at the closed door through which she had vanished puzzled a little chilled he gave his order to the attentive butler who presently appeared and who looked at him with covert interest the press had been almost hysterically prodigal of his name during the last few weeks then he settled down to wait for her return with an impatience which became almost uncontrollable it seemed to him as he paced restlessly about that this little apartment which he remembered so well had in a measure changed was revealing a different atmosphere as though in sympathy with some corresponding change in its presiding spirit there was a huge and well-worn couch smothered with cushions and suggestive of a comfort almost voluptuous a large easy-chair into which he presently sank of the same character the wood logs burning in the grate gave out a pleasant sense of warmth he took more particular note of the volumes in the well-filled bookcases volumes of poetry french novels with a fair sprinkling of modern english fiction there was a plaster cast of the paris magdalen over the door and one or two fine point etchings after the style of helio uh, upon the walls there was no writing-table in the room nor any signs of industry but a black oak gate-table was laden with magazines and fashion papers against the brown walls a clump of flaming yellow gorse leaned from a distant corner its faint almond-like fragrance mingling aromatically with the perfume of burning logs and a great bowl of dried lavender more than ever it seemed to talent that the atmosphere of the room had changed had become in some subtle way at the same time more enervating and more exciting 
it was like a revelation of a hidden side of the woman who might indeed have had some purpose of her own in leaving him here he set down his empty glass with the feeling that vermouth was a heavier drink than he had fancied then a streak of watery sunshine filtered its way through the plantation and crept across the worn handsome carpet he felt a queer exultation at the sound of her footsteps outside she entered as she had departed without directly meeting his earnest gaze i hope you have made yourself at home she said dear me how untidy everything is she moved about altering the furniture a little making little piles of the magazines a graceful elegant figure in her dark velvet house dress with a thin band of fur at the neck she turned suddenly around and found him watching her this time she laughed at him frankly sit down at once she ordered motioning him back to his easy chair and coming herself to a corner of the lounge remember that you have a great deal to tell me and explain the newspapers say such queer things is it true that i really am entertaining a possible future prime minister i suppose that might be he answered a little vaguely his eyes still fixed upon her so this is your room i like it and i like well go on please she begged i like the softness of your gown and i like the fur against your throat and neck and i like those buckles on your shoes and the way you do your hair she laughed gracefully enough yet with some return to that mood of uneasiness you mustn't turn my head she protested you fresh from london which they tell me is terribly gay just now i want to understand just what it means you're throwing in your lot with the democrats my uncle says for instance that you have abandoned respectable politics to become a tower hill pedagogue respectable politics he replied if by that you mean the present government of the country have been in the wrong hands for so long that people scarcely realize what is undoubtedly the fact that the country isn't being governed at all a government with an opposition party almost as powerful as itself all made up of separate parties which are continually demanding sops can scarcely progress very far can it but the democrats she ventured are surely only one of these are isolated parties i have formed a different idea of their strength he answered i believe that if a general election took place to-morrow the democrats would sweep the country i believe that we should have the largest working majority any government has had since the war how terrible she murmured involuntarily truthful your tame socialism isn't equal to the prospect he remarked a little bitterly my tame socialism as you call it she replied draws the line at seeing the country governed by one class of person only and that class the one who has the least at stake in it lady jane he said earnestly i am glad that i am here to point out to you a colossal mistake from which you and many others are suffering the democrats do not represent labor only the small shopkeepers she suggested nothing of the sort he replied the influence of my party has spread far deeper and further we number amongst our adherents the majority of the professional classes and the majority of the thinking people amongst the community of moderate means why if you consider the legislation of the last seven or eight years you will see how they have been driven to embrace some sort of socialism nothing so detestable and short-sighted as our financial policy has ever been known in the history of the world the middle classes meaning by the middle classes professional men and men of moderate means for the chief burden of the war they submitted to terrible taxation to many privations besides the universal gift of their young blood we won the war and what was the result the wealth of the country through ghastly legislation drifted into the hands of the profiteering classes the wholesale shopkeepers the ship owners the factory owners the mine owners the professional man with two thousand a year was able to save a quarter of that before the war after the war taxation demanded that quarter and more for income tax thrust upon him an increased cost of living cut the ground from beneath his feet it isn't either of the two extremes 
the aristocrat or the laboring man where you must look for the pulse of the country's prosperity it is to the classes in between and lady jane they are flocking to our camp just as fast as they can just as fast as the country is heading for ruin under its present government you are very convincing she admitted why have you not spoken so plainly in the house the moment hasn't arrived tallente replied there will be a general election before many months have passed and that will be the end of the present fool's paradise at st stephen's and then we shan't abuse our power he assured her what we aim at is a national party which will consider the interests of every class that is our reading of the term democrat our program is not nearly so revolutionary as you are probably led to believe but we do mean to smooth the way so far as we can from a practical point of view the inequalities of life we want to sweep away the last remnants of feudalism tell me why they were so anxious to gather you into the fold she asked i think for this reason he explained stephen dartrey is a brilliant writer a great orator and an inspired lawmaker the whole world recognizes him as a statesman it is his name and genius which have made the democratic party possible on the other hand he is not in the least a politician he doesn't understand the game as it is played in the house of commons he lives above those things that is why i suppose they wanted me i have learnt the knack of apt debating and i understand the tricks even if ever i become the titular head of the party dartrey will remain the soul and spirit of it if they were not able to lay their hands upon some person like myself i believe that miller was supposed to have the next claim and i should think that miller is the one man in the world who might disunite the strongest party on earth disunite it i should think he would disperse it to the four corners of the world she exclaimed the butler announced luncheon she rose to her feet i cannot tell you he said with a little sigh of relief as he held open the door for her how thankful i am that i happen to find you alone End of chapter 15chapter sixteen of nobody's man by e phillips oppenheim this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Berard. chapter sixteen luncheon was a pleasant even a luxurious meal for the woolhanger chef had come from the ducal household but it was hedged about with restraints which fretted talent and rendered conversation monosyllabic it was served too in the larger dining-room where the table reduced to its smallest dimensions still seemed to place a formidable distance between himself and his hostess a manservant stood behind lady jane's chair and the butler was in constant attendance at the sideboard under such circumstances conversation became precarious and was confined chiefly to local topics when they left the room for their coffee they found it served in the hall talent however protested vigorously can't we have it served in your sitting-room please he begged it is impossible to talk to you here there are people in the background all the time and you might have callers she hesitated for a moment but yielded the point with the door closed and the coffee tray between them talent drew a sigh of relief i hope you don't think i am a nuisance he said bluntly but after all i came down from london purposely to see you i am not so vain as to believe that she answered it is nevertheless true and i think that you do believe it what have i done that you should all of a sudden build a fence around yourself that may be she replied smiling for my own protection i can assure you that i am not used to tete -te luncheons with guests who insist upon having their own way in everything i wonder if it is a good thing for you to be so much your own mistress he reflected you must judge by results i always have been at least since i decided to lead this sort of life why have you never married he asked her a little abruptly we discussed that before didn't we i suppose because the right man has never asked me 
perhaps he ventured the right man isn't able to perhaps there isn't any right man at all perhaps there never will be the minutes ticked away the room with its mingled perfumes and pleasant warmth its manifold associations with her wholesome and orderly life seemed to have laid a sort of spell upon him she was leaning back in her corner of the lounge her hands hanging over the sides her eyes fixed upon the burning log she herself was so abstracted that he ventured to let his eyes dwell upon her to trace the outline of her slim but powerful limbs to admire her long delicate feet and hands the strong womanly face with its kindly mouth and soft almost affectionate eyes tallente who for the last ten years had looked upon the other sex as non-existent crushed into an interesting negation for him owing to his wife's cold and shadowy existence twice within the last few months found himself pass in a different way nora miall had provoked his curiosity had reawakened a dormant sense of sex without attracting it towards herself jane brought to him again from the first moment he had seen her that half wistful recrudescence of the sentiment of his earlier days he was amazed to find how once more in her presence that sentiment had taken to itself fire and life how different a thing it was from those first dreams of her which had seemed like an echo from the period of his poetry reading youth of all women in the world she seemed to him now the most desirable that she was unattainable he was perfectly willing to admit even then he had not the strength to deny himself the doubtful joys of imagination with regard to her he revelled in her proximity because of the pleasure it gave him heedless or reckless of consequences between them in vastly different degrees these two women seemed to have brought him back something of his youth the silence became noticeable led him at last into a certain measure of alarm lady jane he ventured have i said anything to offend you of course not she answered looking at him kindly you are very silent are you afraid that i am going to attempt to make love to you she was startled in earnest this time she sat up and looked at him disapprovingly there was a touch of the old hauteur in her tone how can you be so ridiculous she exclaimed would it be ridiculous of me does it occur to you she asked that i am the sort of person to encourage attentions from a man who is not free to offer them i had forgotten that he admitted quite frankly of course i see the point i have a wife even though of her own choosing she does not count she exists so do i jane broke into a little laugh oh, now we are both being absurd she declared and i don't want you to be of course you can't look at things just as i do you belong to a very large world you spend your life destroying obstacles all my people you know she went on look upon me as terribly emancipated they think my mild socialism and my refusal to listen to such a thing as a chaperone most terribly improper but at heart you know i am still a very conventional person i have torn down a great many conventions but there are some upon which i cannot bring myself even to lay my fingers perhaps it wouldn't be you if you did he reflected perhaps not and yet he went on tell me are you wholly content here your life in its way is splendid you live as much for the benefit of others as for yourself you are encouraging the right principle amongst your yeomen and your farmers you are setting your heel upon feudalism you the daughter of a race who have always demanded it you live among these wonderful surroundings you grow into the bigness of them nature becomes almost your friend it is one of the most dignified and beautiful lives i ever knew for a woman and yet are you wholly content i am not she admitted frankly and listen she went on after a moment's pause i will show you how much i trust you how much i really want you to understand me 
i am not completely happy because i know perfectly well that it is unnatural to live as i do if i met the man i could care for and who cared for me i should prefer to be married she had commenced her speech with the faintest tinge of color burning underneath the wholesome sunburn of her cheeks she had spoken boldly enough even though towards the end of her sentence her voice had grown very low when she finished however it seemed as though the memory of her words were haunting her as though she suddenly realized the nakedness of them she buried her face in her hands and he saw her shoulders heave as though she were sobbing he stood very close and for the first time he touched her he held the fingers of her hand gently in his dear lady jane he begged don't regret even for a moment that you have spoken naturally if we are to be friends to be anything at all to one another it is wonderful of you to tell me so sweetly what women take such absurd pains to conceal when you look up let us start our friendship all over again only before you do listen to my confession if fifteen years could be rolled off my back and i were free it isn't political ambition i should look to for my guiding star i should have one far greater far more wonderful desire the fingers he held were gently withdrawn she drew herself up her forehead was wrinkled questioningly she forced a smile you would be very foolish she said if you tried to part with one of those fifteen years every one has brought you experience every one has helped to make you what you are and yet he began he broke off abruptly in his speech the hall seemed suddenly full of voices jane rose to her feet at the sound of approaching footsteps she made the slightest possible grimace but talent was oppressed with a suspicion that the interruption was not altogether unwelcome to her some of my cousins and their friends from minehead she said i am so sorry i expect they have lost the hunt and come here for tea the room was almost instantly invaded by a company of light-hearted noisy young people flushed with exercise and calling aloud for tea intimates all of them calling one another by their christian names speaking a jargon which sounded to talent like another language he stayed for a quarter of an hour and then took his leave of the newcomers no one seemed to have an idea who he was no one seemed to care in the least whether he remained or went he was only able to snatch a word of farewell with jane at the door she shook her head at his whispered request i am afraid not she answered how could i besides there is no telling when this crowd will go you are sure you won't let me send you home talent shook his head the walk will do me good he said i get lazy in town but you are sure the butler was holding open the door two of the girls had suddenly taken possession of jane she shook her head slightly good-bye she called out come and see me next time you are down talent was suddenly his old self grave and severe he bowed stiffly in response to the little chorus of farewells and followed the butler down the hall the latter who was something of a politician did his best to indicate by his manner his appreciation of talent's position you are sure you won't allow me to order a car sir he said with his hand upon the door i know her ladyship would be only too pleased it's a long step to the manor and if you'll forgive my saying so sir you've a good deal on your shoulders just now talent caught a glimpse of the bleak moorland and of the distant hills wrapped in mist the idea of vigorous exercise however appealed to him he shook his head i'd rather walk thanks he said it's a matter of five miles sir talent smiled there was something in the fresh cold air wonderfully alluring after the atmosphere of the room he had quitted he turned his coat collar up and strode down the avenue End of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of nobody's man by e phillips oppenheim 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Berard. Chapter 17 Talent reached the manor about an hour and a half later, mud splashed, wet, and weary. Robert followed him into the study and mixed him a whiskey and soda. You've walked all the way back, sir, he remarked, with a note of protest in his tone they offered me a car talent admitted i didn't want it i came down for fresh air and exercise two very good things in their way sir but easily overdone was the mild rejoinder these hills are terrible unless you're at them all the time talent drank his whiskey and soda almost greedily and felt the benefits of it although he was still weary he had walked for five miles in the company of ghosts and their faces had gone gray perhaps too it was the passing of his youth which brought this tiredness to his limbs robert he confessed abruptly i was a fool to come down here at all it's dreary at this time of the year unless you've time to shoot or hunt sir why not motor to bath to-morrow i could wire for rooms and i could drive you up to london the next day motoring's a good way of getting the air sir and you won't overtire yourself i'll think of it in the morning his master promised my wife has found the silver sir robert announced as he turned to leave the room and i managed to get a little fish that with some soup a pheasant and a fruit tart we thought i shall be alone robert talent interrupted there is no one coming for dinner the man's disappointment was barely concealed he sighed as he took up the tray very good sir your clothes are all out. I'll turn on the hot water in the bathroom. Talent threw off his rain and mud-soaked clothes, bathed, changed, and descended to the dining room, just as the gong sounded. Robert was in the act of moving the additional place from the little round dining table, which he had drawn up closer to the wood fire, but his master stopped him. You can let those things be, he directed. Take away the champagne, though. I shan't want that robert bowed in silent appreciation of his master's humour and began ladling out soup at the sideboard talent's lips were curled a little partly in self-contempt with perhaps just a dash of self-pity it had come to this then that he must dine with fancies rather than alone that his tardily developed streak of sentimentality must be ministered to or would drag him into the depths of dejection he began to understand the psychology of its late appearance stella's artificial companionship had kept his thoughts imprisoned fettered with the meshes of an instinctive fidelity and had driven him sedulously to the solace of work and books now that it was removed and he was to all practical purposes a free man they took their own course his life had suddenly become a natural one and all that was human in him responded to the possibilities of his solitude he had had as yet no time to experience the relief to appreciate his liberty before he was face to face with this new loneliness to-night he thought as he looked at the empty place and remembered his wistful almost diffident invitation the solitude was almost in unendurable if she had only understood how much meant surely she would have made some effort would not have been content with that half embarrassed half doubtful shake of the head in the darkened room with the throb of the sea and the crackling of the logs in his ears only robert's silent form for company he felt a sudden craving for things of his youth for another side of life the restaurants the bright eyes of women the whispered words of pleasant sentiment the perfume shaken into the atmosphere they created the low music in the background i beg your pardon sir robert said in his ear your soup gertrude has taken such pains with the dinner sir he added diffidently if i might take the liberty of suggesting it it would be as well if you could eat something talent took up his spoon then they both started they both turned to the window a light had flashed into the room a low purring sound came from outside a car sir robert exclaimed his face full of pleasurable anticipation if you'll excuse me i'll answer the door might it be the lady after all sir 
He hurried out. Tallente rose slowly to his feet. He was listening intently. The thing was impossible, he told himself. It was impossible. Then he heard a voice in the hall. Robert threw the door open and announced, in a tone of triumph, Lady Jane Partington, sir. She came towards him, smiling, self-possessed, but a little interrogative. He had a lightning-like impression of her beautiful shoulders rising from her plain black gown, her delightfully easy walk, the slimness and comeliness and stateliness of her. I know that I ought to be ashamed of myself for a coming after I told you I couldn't she said it will serve me right if you've eaten all the dinner but i do hope you haven't i had only just sat down he told her as he and robert held her chair and i think that this is the kindest action you ever performed in your life robert his face glowing with satisfaction had become ubiquitous she had scarcely subsided into her chair before he was offering her a cocktail on a silver tray serving talent with his forgotten glass at the sideboard ladling out soup out of the room and in again bringing back a rejected bottle of champagne you will never believe that i am a sane person again she laughed after you had gone and all those foolish children had departed i felt it was quite impossible to sit down and dine alone i wanted so much to come and i realized how ridiculous it was of me not to have accepted at once at the last moment i couldn't bear it any longer so i rushed into the first gown i could find ordered out my little coupe and here i am the most welcome guest who ever came to a lonely man he assured her a moment ago robert was complaining because i was sending my soup away now i shall show him what devon eyre can do the champagne was excellent and the dinner over which gertrude had taken so much care was after all thoroughly appreciated tallente suddenly and unexpectedly light-hearted felt a keen desire to entertain his welcome guest and remembered his former successes as a raconteur they pushed politics and all personal matters far away he dug up reminiscences of his days in foreign capitals when he had first entered the diplomatic service betrayed his intimate knowledge of the florence which they both loved of paris where she had studied and which he had seen under so many aspects paris the home of beauty and fashion before the war torn with anguish and horror during its earlier stages grim steadfast and sombre in the days of verdun wildly madly exultant when wreathed and decorated with victory there were so many things to talk about for two people of agile brains come together late in life they had moved into the study and lady jane was seated in his favourite easy-chair sipping her coffee and some wonderful green chartreuse before a single personal note had crept into the flow of their conversation it can't be that i am in devonshire she said i never realised how much like a succession of pictures conversation can be you seem to remind me so much of things which i have kept locked away just because i have had no one to share them with you are in devonshire all right he answered smiling you will realize it when you turn out of my avenue and face the hills you see you've dropped down from the fairyland of up over to the nesting place of the owls and the gulls nine hundred feet she murmured thank heavens for my forty horsepower engine i want to see the sea break against your rocks she went on as she took the cigarette which he passed her there used to be a little path through your plantation to a place where you look sheer down don't you remember you took me there the first time i came to see you in august and i have never forgotten it he rang the bell for her coat that the night though windy and dark was warm stars shone out from unexpected places pencil-like streaks of inky black clouds stretched menacingly across the sky the wind came down from the moors above with a dull boom which seemed echoed by the waves beating against the giant rocks the heads of the bare trees among which they passed were bent this way and that and the few remaining leaves rustled in vain resistance or yielding to the irresistible gusts 
sailed for a moment towards the skies to be dashed down into the ever-growing carpet the path was narrow and they walked in single file but at the bend he drew level with her walking on the seaward side and guiding her with his fingers upon her arm presently they reached the little circular space where rustic seats had been placed and leaned over a grey stone wall there was nothing of the midsummer charm about the scene to-night sheer below them the sea driven by tide and wind rushed upon the huge masses of rock or beat direct upon the cave indented cliffs the spray leapt high into the air to be caught up by the wind in whirlpools little ghostly flecks luminous one moment and gone for ever the next far away across the pitchy waters they could see at regular intervals a line of white where the breakers came rushing in here and there the agitated lights of passing steamers opposite the twin flares on the welsh coast at every sixty seconds the swinging white illumination from the linmouth lighthouse shining up from behind the headland jane slipped one hand through his arm and stood there breathless rapturously watchful this is wonderful she murmured it is the one thing we have always lacked at woolhanger we get the booming of the wind wonderful it is too like the hollow thunder of guns or the quick passing of an underground army but we miss this i feel somehow as though i knew now why it tears past us uprooting the very trees that stand in its way it rushes to the sea what a meeting her hand tightened upon his arm as a great wave broke direct upon the cliff below and a torrent of wind rushing through the trees and downwards caught the spray and scattered it around them and high over their heads the humans he whispered are taught our lesson do we need it she asked with sudden fierceness do you believe that because some mysterious power imposes restraint upon us the passion isn't there all the while she was suddenly in his arms the warm wind shrieking about them the darkness thick and soft as a mantle only he saw the anguished happiness in her eyes as they closed beneath his kisses one moment out of life she faltered one moment another great wave shook the ground beneath them but she had drawn away she struggled for breath then once more her hand was thrust through his arm he knew so well that his hour was over and he submitted back please she whispered back through the plantation quietly an almost supernatural instinct divined and acceded to her desire for silence so they walked slowly back towards the long low house whose faint lights flickered through the trees she leaned a little upon him the hand which she had passed through his arm was clasped in his only the wind spoke when at last they were on the terrace she drew a long breath dear friend she said softly see how i trust you i leave in your keeping the most precious few minutes of my life this is to be the end then he faltered it is not we who have decided that she answered it is just what must be you go to a very difficult life a very splendid one i have my smaller task don't unfit it don't unfit me for it we will each do our best her servant was waiting by the car his figure loomed up through the darkness you will come into the house for a few minutes he begged hoarsely she shook her head why our farewells have been spoken i leave you so the man had disappeared behind the bonnet of the car she grasped his hand with both of hers and brushed it lightly with her lips then she glided away a moment later he was listening to her polite speeches as she leaned out of the coupe my dinner was too wonderful she said do make my compliments to that dear robert and his wife good luck to you and don't rob us poor landowners of every penny we possess in life the car was gone in the midst of his vague little response he watched the lights go flashing up the hillside crawling around the hairpin corners up until it seemed that 
they had reached the black clouds and were climbing into the heavens then he turned back into the house the world was still a place for dreams End of chapter 17chapter eighteen of nobody's man by e phillips oppenheim this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter eighteen tallente sat in the morning train on his way to town and on the other side of the bare ridge at which he gazed so earnestly lady jane and segerson had brought their horses to a standstill halfway along a rude cart track which led up to a farmhouse tucked away in the valley this is where james crockford's land commences segerson remarked riding up to his companion's side look around you i think you will admit that i have not exaggerated she frowned thoughtfully on every side were evidences of poor farming and neglect the untrimmed hedges had been broken down in many places by cattle a plough which seemed as though it had been embedded there for ages stood in the middle of a half-ploughed field several tracts of land which seemed prepared for winter sowing were covered with stones the farmhouse yard into which they presently passed was dirty and untidy sagerson leaned down and knocked on the door with his whip after a short delay a slatternly-looking woman with tousled fair hair answered the summons mr crockford in Sigerson asked you'll find him in the living-room the woman answered curtly with a stare at lady jane here's himself she retreated into the background a man with flushed face without collar or tie clad in trousers and shirt only had stepped out of the parlour he stared at his visitors in embarrassment i came over to have a word or two with you on business mr crockford jane said coldly i rather expected to find you on the land the man mumbled something and threw open the door of the sitting-room won't you come in he invited there's just mr pettigrew here the vet from barnstable he's come over to look at one of my cows mr pettigrew also flushed rose to his feet jane acknowledged his greeting and glanced around the room it was untidy dirty and close smelling strongly of tobacco and beer on the table was a bottle of whiskey half empty and two glasses there is really no reason why i should disturb you jane said turning back upon the threshold a letter from mr segerson will do crockford however had pulled himself together a premonition of his impending fate had already produced a certain sullenness pettigrew he directed you get out and have another look at the cow if you've any business word to say to me your ladyship i'm here jane looked once more around the squalid room watched the unsteady figure of pettigrew departing and looked back at her tenant your lease is up on march the twenty-fifth crockford she reminded him i have come to tell you that i shall not be prepared to renew it the man simply blinked at her his fuddled brain was not equal to grappling with such a catastrophe your farm is favorably situated she continued and although small has great possibilities i find you are dropping behind your neighbors and your crops are poorer each season have you saved any money crockford saved any money the man blustered shepherd's wages alone at two pounds a week and a week's rain starting in the day i began haymaking why my barley you started your haymaking ten days too late segerson interrupted sternly you had plenty of warning and as for your barley you sold it in the king's arms at barnstaple when you'd had too much to drink at thirty per cent below its value jane turned towards the door i need not stay any longer she said i wanted to look at your farm for myself mr crockford and i thought it only right that you should have early notice of my intention to ask you to vacate the place the cold truth was finding its way into the man's consciousness it had a wonderfully sobering effect look here ma'am he demanded is it true that you lent farmer holyroyd four hundred pounds to buy his own farm and the crocombe brothers two hundred each quite true jane replied coldly what of it what of it 
the man repeated you lend them youngsters money and then you come to me a man who's been on this land for twenty-two years and you've nothing to say but get out where am i to find another farm at my time of life just answer me that will you it is not my concern jane declared i only know that i decline to have any tenants on my property who do not do justice to the land when i see that they do justice to it then it is my wish that they should possess it it is true that i have lent money to some of the farmers round here but the greater part of what they have put down for the purchase of their holdings is savings money they had saved and earned by working early and late by careful farming and husbandry by putting money in the bank every quarter you have had the same opportunity you have preferred to waste your time and waste your money you have had more than one warning you know crockford ay more than a dozen segerson muttered the man looked at them both and there was a dull hate gathering in his eyes it's easy to talk about saving money and working hard you that have got everything you want in life and no work to do he protested it's enough to make a man turn socialist to listen to him mr crockford jane said i am a socialist and if you take the trouble to understand even the rudiments of socialism you will learn that the drones have as small a part in that scheme of life as in any other you have a right to what you produce it is one of the pleasures of my life to help the deserving to enjoy what they produce it is also one of the duties when i find a non-productive person filling a position to which his daily life and character do not entitle him to pull him up like a weed that is my idea of socialism mr crockford you will leave on march twenty fifth they rode homeward into a gathering storm a mass of black clouds was rolling up from the north and an unexpected wind came bellowing down the combs bending the stunted oaks and dark pines and filling the air with sonorous but ominous music the hills around soon became invisible blotted out by fragments of the gathering mists the cold sleet stung their faces out on the moors was no sound but the tinkling of distant sheep bells there's snow coming sigerson muttered as he turned up his coat collar it won't do any harm she answered the earth lies warm under it the lights of paracombe precipitous and unexpected were like flecks in the sky wiped out by a sudden driving storm of sleet a little while later they cantered up the avenue to woolhanger and jane slipped from her horse with a little sigh of relief you'd better stay and have some tea mr segerson she invited john will take your horse and give him a rub down she changed her habit and forgetting her guest indulged in the luxury of a hot bath she descended some time later to find him sitting in front of the tea tray in the hall a more than usually gracious smile soon drove the frown from his forehead i really am frightfully sorry she apologized as she handed him his tea i had no idea i was so wet you'll have rather a bad ride home oh i'm used to it he answered i'm afraid they'll lose a good many sheep on the higher farms though if the storm turns out as bad as it threatens hear that a tornado of wind seemed to shake the ground beneath their feet jane shivered i suppose she reflected that man crockford thought i was very cruel to-day i will tell you crockford's point of view segerson replied he doesn't exactly understand what your aims are and wherever he goes he hears nothing but praise of the way you have treated your tenants and the way you have tried to turn them into small landowners he isn't intelligent enough to realize that there is a principle behind all this he has simply come to feel that he has a lenient landlord and that he has only to sit still and the plums will drop into his mouth too crockford is one of the weak spots in your system lady jane there is no place for him or his kind in a self-supporting world she sighed then i am afraid he must go down she said he simply stands in the way of better men one reads a good deal of mr tallente nowadays segerson remarked changing the conversation a little abruptly 
jane leaned over and struck the head of a dog which had come to lie at her feet he seems to be making a good deal of stir she observed the young man frowned you know i am not unsympathetic with your views lady jane he said a little awkwardly but i don't mind admitting that if i had a big stake in the country i should be afraid of talent no one seems to be able to pin him down to a definite programme and yet day by day his influence grows the labour party is disintegrated the best of all its factions are joining the democrats he is practically leader of the opposition party to-day and i don't see how they are going to stop his being prime minister whenever he chooses don't you think he'll make a good prime minister jane asked no i don't was the curt answer he is too dark a horse for my fancy i expect mr tallente will be ready with his programme when the time comes she observed he is a people's man of course and his proposals will sound pretty terrible to a good many of the old school still something of the sort has to come the butler brought in the post-bag while they talked Segerson, as he rose to depart glanced with curiosity at half a dozen orange-coloured wrappers which were among the rest of the letters fancy your subscribing to a press-cutting agency lady jane he exclaimed you haven't been writing a novel under a pseudonym have you she laughed as she gathered up her correspondence in her hand don't pry into my secrets she enjoined we may meet in barnstaple to-morrow if the weather clears i want to go in and see those cattle for myself the young man took his reluctant departure jane crossed the hall entered her own little sanctum threw the lamp to the edge of the table and sank into her easy-chair with a little sigh of relief all the rest of her correspondence she threw to one side the orange-coloured wrappers she tore off one by one as she read her face softened and her eyes grew very bright the first cutting was a report of tallente's last speech in the house a clever and forceful attack upon the government's policy of compromise in the matter of recent strikes the next was a speech at the holborn town hall on workmen's dwellings another a thoughtful appreciation of him from the pages of the great review there was also a eulogy from an american journal and a gloomy attack upon him in the chief whig organ when she had finished the pile she sat for some time gazing at the burning logs the little epitome of his daily life there were records there even of many of his social engagements seemed to carry her into another atmosphere an atmosphere far removed from this lonely spot upon the moors she seemed to catch from those printed lines some faint reflective thrill of the more vital world of strife in which he was living for a moment the roar of london was in her ears she saw the lighted thoroughfares the crowded pavements the faces of the men and women all a little strained and eager so different from the placid immobility of the world in which she lived she rose to her feet and moved restlessly about the room presently she lifted the curtain and looked out there was a pause in the storm and a great mass of black clouds had just been driven past the face of the watery moon even the wind seemed to be holding its breath but so far as she could see moors and hillsides were wrapped in one unending mantle of snow there was no visible sign of any human habitation no sound from any of the birds or animals who were cowering in their shelters not even a sheep bell or the barking of a dog to break the profound silence she dropped the curtain and turned back to her chair her feet were leaden and her heart was heavy the struggle of the day was at an end memory was asserting itself she felt the flush in her cheek the quickening beat of her heart the thrill of her pulses as she lived again through those few wild minutes there was no longer any escape from the wild confusing truth the thing which she had dreaded had come End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of nobody's man by e phillips oppenheim this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Ferrard. chapter nineteen the most popular hostess in london was a little thrilled at the arrival of the moment 
for which she had planned so carefully she laid her hand on tallente's arm and led him towards a comparatively secluded corner of the winter garden which made her own house famous i must apologize mrs van fosdyke he said for my late appearance i travelled up from devonshire this afternoon and found snow all the way we were nearly two hours late it is all the more kind of you to have turned out at all then she told him warmly i don't mind telling you that i should have been terribly disappointed if you had failed me it has been my one desire for months to have you three the prime minister lethbridge and you under my roof at the same time you find politics interesting over here tallente asked a little curiously she flashed a quick glance at him why i find them absolutely fascinating she declared the whole thing is so incomprehensible just look at to-night half of debrett is represented here practically the whole of the diplomats and yet except yourself not a single member of the political party who we are told will be ruling this country within a few months the very anomaly of it is so fascinating there is no necessary kinship between society and politics tallente reminded her your own country for instance mrs van fosdyke who was an american shrugged her shoulders my own country scarcely counts she protested after all we came into being as a republic and our aristocracy is only a spurious conglomeration of people who are too rich to need to work but many of these people whom you see here to-night still possess feudal rights vast estates great names and yet over their heads there is coming this government in which they will be wholly unrepresented what are you going to do with the aristocracy mr tallente encourage them to work he answered smiling but they don't know how they must learn no man has a right to his place upon the earth unless he is a productive human being there is no room in the world which we are trying to create for the parasite pure and simple you are a very inflexible person mr tallente there is no place in politics for the wobbler do you know she went on glancing away for a moment that my rooms are filled with people who fear you the labor party as it was understood here five or six years ago never inspired that feeling there was something of the tub thumper about every one of them i think it is your repression mr tallente which terrifies them you don't say what you are going to do your program is still a secret and yet every day your majority grows only an hour ago the prime minister told me that he couldn't carry on if you threw down the gauge in earnest tallente remained bland but became a little vague i see folds among your guests he observed have you seen his statue of perseus in andromeda she laughed i have but i am not going to discuss it of course i accept the hint but as a matter of fact i am a person to be trusted i ask for no secrets i have no position in this country even my sympathies are at present wobbling i am simply a little thrilled to have you here because the prime minister is within a few yards of us and i know that before many weeks are past the great struggle will come between you and him as to who shall guide the destinies of this country you forget mrs van fosdyke he objected that i am not even the leader of my party stephen dartrey is our chief she shook her head dartrey is a brilliant person she admitted but we all know that he is not a practical politician the battle is between you and horlock tallente was watching a woman go by a woman in black and silver whose walk reminded him of jane his hostess followed his eyes you are one of alice mountgarren's admirers she inquired i don't even know her he replied she reminded me of someone for a moment she is one of the duchess of barminster's daughters his companion told him she married mountgarren last year her sister lady jane is rather inclined towards your political outlook she lives in devonshire and tries to be good his eyes followed the woman in black and silver until she had passed out of sight the family likeness was there appealing to him curiously tugging at his heart-strings his artificial surroundings slipped easily away he was back on the moors he felt a sniff of the strong wind 
the wholesome exultation of the empty places a more wonderful memory still was sweeping in upon him his companion intervened chillingly one never sees your wife nowadays mr tallente my wife is in america he answered mechanically she has gone there to stay with some relatives she is interested in politics not in the least mrs van fosdyke welcomed a newcomer with a gracious little smile and tallente rose to his feet horlock had left the group in the centre of the room and was making his way towards them at least we can talk here he said shaking hands with tallente without any suggestion of a conspiracy the old gang you know he went on addressing his hostess simply close around me when i try to have a word with tallente they are afraid of some marvellous combination which is going to shut them out lethbridge is the only one of them here to-night she observed and he is probably in one of the rooms where they are serving things now i must go back to my guests if i see him i'll head him off she strolled away the prime minister sank back upon a couch his air of well-bred content with himself and life fell away from him the moment his hostess was out of sight tallente he said i suppose you mean to break us i thought we'd been rather friendly was the quiet reply we've been letting you have your own way for nearly a month that is simply because we are on work which we are tackling practically in the fashion you dictated Herlock pointed out when we have finished this irish business what are you going to do i am not the leader of the party tallente reminded him from a parliamentary point of view you are was the impatient protest dartrey is a dreamer he might even have dreamed away his opportunities if you hadn't come along miller would never have handled the house as you have miller was made to create factions you were made to coalesce to smooth over difficulties to bring men of opposite points of view into the same camp you are a genius at it tallente six months ago i was only afraid of the democrats now i dread them shall i tell you what it is that worries me most if you think it wise your absence of program why don't you say what you want to do give us some idea of how far you are going to carry your tenants are we to have the anarchy of bolshevists or the socialism of marx a red flag republic or a classical dictatorship we are not out for anarchy at all events tallente assured him nor for revolutions in the ordinary sense of the word you mean to upset the constitution speaking officially i do not know speaking to you as a fellow politician i should say that sooner or later some changes are desirable you'll never get away from party government perhaps not but i dare say we can find machinery to prevent the house of commons being used for a debating society horlock whose sense of humour had never been entirely crushed by the exigencies of political leadership suddenly grinned the old gang will commit suicide he declared if they aren't allowed to spout they'll either wither or die old man lethbridge's monthly attacks of high-minded patriotism are the only things that keep him alive i don't fancy tallente remarked that we shall abandon any of our principles for the sake of keeping lethbridge alive what the mischief are your principles no doubt dartrey would enlighten you if you chose to go to him was the indifferent reply within the course of the next few months we shall launch our thunderbolt you will know then what we claim for the people hang the people horlock exclaimed i've legislated for them myself until i'm sick of it they're never grateful perhaps you confine yourself too much to one class tallente observed dryly as a rule the less intelligent the voter the more easily he is caught by flashy legislation the operative pure and simple horlock announced has no political outlook he'll never see beyond his trades union he'll never found a great national party with his aid his companion smiled then we shall fail and you will continue to be prime minister mrs van fosdyke came back to them on the arm of a foreign diplomat she leaned over to horlock and whispered 
lethbridge has heard that you two are here together and he is on your track better separate she passed on the two men strolled away have you any personal feeling against me tallente pollock asked none whatever his companion assured him you did me the best turn in your life when you left me stranded after hellsfield pollock sighed lethbridge almost insisted he looked upon you as a firebrand he said there would be no repose about a cabinet with you in it well it's turned out for the best tallente remarked dryly au revoir on his way back to the reception rooms an acquaintance tapped him on the shoulder one moment tallente lady alice montgaron has asked me to present you tallente bowed before the woman who stood looking at him pleasantly but a little curiously she held out her hand i seem to have heard so much of you from my sister jane she said you are neighbors in devonshire aren't you neighbors from a devon man's point of view he answered i live halfway down a precipice and she five miles away at the back of a stygian moor and incidentally a thousand feet above me you seem to have surmounted such geographical obstacles your sister's friendship is worth greater efforts tallente replied lady alice smiled i wish that some of you could persuade her to come to town occasionally she asked jane is a perfect dear of course and i know she does a great deal of good down there but i can't help thinking sometimes that she is a little wasted life must now and then be dreary for her tallente seemed for a moment to be looking through the walls of the room we are all made differently lady jane is very self-reliant and devonshire is one of those counties which have a curiously strong local hold but when her moors and her farms are under snow and woolhanger is wreathed in mists and one hears nothing except the moaning of animals in distress what about the local attraction then you speak feelingly tallente observed smiling i spent a fortnight with jane last winter she explained i had some idea of hunting never again only i miss jane she is such a dear and i don't see half enough of her i saw her yesterday tallente said reminiscently this morning she told me she was going to ride out to inspect for herself the farm of the one black sheep amongst her tenants i looked out towards woolhanger as i came up in the train it seemed like a miasma of driven snow and mist every one to his tastes lady alice observed as she turned away with a friendly little nod i have just an idea however that this morning's excursion was a little too much even for jane what do you mean tallente asked eagerly lady alice looked at him over the top of her fan she was a woman of instinct i had a telegram from her just before i came out she said there wasn't much in it but it gave me an idea that after all perhaps she is thinking of a short visit to town come and see me mr tallente won't you i live in mount street number seventeen my husband used to play cricket with you i think she passed on and tallente stood looking after her for a moment a little dazed a friend came up and took him by the arm unprotected and alone in the gilded halls of the enemy the newcomer exclaimed come and have a drink by the by you look as though you'd had good news i have tallente assented smiling then we'll drink to it mummel not bad stuff this way End of chapter 19Chapter Twenty of Nobody's Man by E. Philip Sopinon. The Slipperbox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Berard. Chapter Twenty. Talent, for the first time in his life, was dining a few evenings later at Darter's house in Chelsea, and he looked forward with some curiosity to this opportunity of studying his chief under different auspices dartrey notwithstanding the fact that he was a miracle of punctuality and devotion to duty both at the offices in parliament street and at the house seemed to have the gift of fading absolutely out of sight from the ken of even his closest friends when the task of the day was accomplished he excused himself always courteously but finally 
from accepting anything whatever in the way of social entertainment he belonged to no clubs and if pressed he frankly confessed a predilection which amounted almost to a passion for solitude during those hours not actually devoted to official duties the invitation to dinner therefore was received by tallente with some surprise he had grown into the habit of looking upon dartrey as a man who had no real existence outside the routine of their daily work he welcomed with avidity therefore his opportunity of understanding a little more thoroughly dartrey's pleasant but elusive personality the house itself situated in a chelsea square of some repute was small and unostentatious but was painted a spotless white and possessed even from the outside an air of quiet and unassuming elegance a trim maid-servant opened the door and ushered him into a drawing-room of grey and silver with a little faded blue in the silks of the french chairs there were a few fine point etchings upon the walls a small grand piano in a corner and very little furniture although the little there was was french of the best period there were no flowers and the atmosphere would have been chilly but for the brightly burning fire tallente was scarcely surprised when dartrey's entrance alone indicated the fact that as was generally supposed he was free from family ties i am a little early i am afraid tallente remarked as they shook hands admirably punctual the other replied i shall make no apologies to you for my small party i have asked only miss miall and miller to meet you just the trio of us who came to lure you out of your devonshire paradise miller tallente repeated with instant comprehension yes i was thinking only the other day that you scarcely see enough of miller i see all that i want to was tallente's candid comment dartrey laid his hand upon his guest's shoulder in a sombre dinner garb with low turned-down collar and flowing black tie his grey-black beard cut into a point his high forehead his straightly brushed back hair which still betrayed its tendency to natural curls he looked a great deal more like an artist of the dreamy and aesthetic type than a man who had elaborated a new system of life and government it is because of the feeling behind those words tallente he said that i have asked you to meet him here to-night miller has his objectionable points but he possesses still a great hold upon certain types of the working man i feel that you should appreciate that a little more thoroughly the politician as you should know better than i has no personal feelings the politician is left with very few luxuries tallente replied with a certain grimness nora was announced brilliant and gracious in a new dinner gown which she frankly confessed had ruined her and close behind her miller a little ungainly in his over-long dress coat and badly arranged white tie it struck tallente that he was aware of the object of the meeting and his manner obviously intended to be ingratiating and still a touch of self-conscious truculence they went into dinner a few minutes later and their host's tact in including nora in the party was at once apparent she talked brightly of the small happenings of their day-to-day -day political life and bridged over the moments of awkwardness before general conversation assumed its normal swing dartrey encouraged miller to talk and they all listened while he spoke of the mammoth trades unions of the north where his hold upon the people was greatest he spoke still bitterly of the war from the moral effect of which he argued the working man had never wholly recovered tallente listened a little grimly the fervour of self-sacrifice and so-called patriotism which some of the proletariat undoubtedly felt at the outbreak of the war miller argued was only an incidental a purely passing sensation compared to the idle and greedy inertia which followed it the war lost he went on might have acted as a lash upon the torpor of many of these men one it created a wave of immorality and extravagance from which they have never recovered they spent more than they had and they earned more than they were worth that is to say they lived an unnatural life it is fortunate then tallente remarked that the new generation is almost here they too carried the taint miller insisted tallente looked thoughtfully across towards his host 
it seems to me that this is a little disheartening he said it is exactly what one might have expected from horlock or even lethbridge miller who is nearer to the proletariat than any of us would have us believe that the people who should be the bulwark of the state are not fit for their position i fancy dartrey said soothingly that miller was talking more as a philosopher than a practical man i speak according to my experiences the latter insisted a little doggedly amongst your own constituents tallente asked with a faint smile reminiscent of a recent unexpected defeat of one of miller's partisans in a large constituency among them and others was the somewhat acid reply sands lost his seat at tenchester through the apathy of the very class for whom we fight tenchester is a wonderful place nora intervened i went down there lately to study certain phases of women's labour their factories are models and i found all the people with whom i came in contact exceptionally keen and well informed miller gnawed his moustache for a moment then i was probably unpopular there he said i have to tell the truth sometimes people do not like it the dinner was simply but daintily served there were wines of well-known vintages and as the meal progressed dartrey unbent eating scarcely anything and drinking less the purely intellectual stimulus of conversation seemed to unloose his tongue and give to his pronouncements a more pungent tone naturally politics remained the subject of discussion and dartrey disclosed a little the reason for the meeting which he had arranged the craft of politics he pointed out makes but one inexorable demand upon her followers the demand for unity the amazing thing is that this is not generally realized it seems the fashion nowadays to dissent from everything to cultivate the ego in its narrowest sense and rather than to try and reach out and grasp the hands of those around the fault i think is in an overdeveloped theatrical sense the desire which so many clever men have for individual notoriety we democrats have prospered because we have been free from it we have been able to sink our individual prejudices in our cause that is because our cause has been great enough we aim so high we see so clearly that it is rare indeed to find amongst us those individual differences which have been the ruin of every political party up to today we have no brown who will not serve with smith no robinson who declines to be associated with jones we forget the small things which are repugnant to us in a fellow man because of the great things which bind us together to a certain extent yes tallente agreed with some reserve in his tone yet we are all human there are some prejudices which no man may conquer if he pretends he does he only lives in an atmosphere of falsehood the strong man loves or hates they took their coffee in their host's very fascinating study there was little room here for decoration the walls were lined with books there were a few choice bronzes here and there a statue of wonderful beauty upon the writing-table and a figure of justice leaning with outstretched arms over the world presented to dartrey by a great french artist for the rest there were comfortable chairs an ample fire and a round table on which were set out coffee and liqueurs of many sorts you will find that i am not altogether an anchorite dartrey observed as they settled into their places i am a lover of old brandy the sixty-eight i recommend especially tallente and bring your chair round to the fire there are cigars and cigarettes at your elbow miller i think i know your taste help yourself won't you miller drank creme de menthe and smoked homemade virginia cigarettes tallente watched him and sighed then suddenly conscious of his host's critical scrutiny he felt an impulse of shame felt that his contempt for the man had in it something almost snobbish he leaned forward and did his best miller had been a school board teacher an exhibitioner at college and was possessed of a singular though limited intelligence he could deal adequately with any one problem presented by itself and affected only by local conditions yet the more talent talked with him the more he realized his lack of breadth his curious weakness of judgment 
when called upon to consider questions dependent upon varying considerations as to the right or wrong wording of a clause in the factory amendment act he could be lucid explanatory and convincing as to the justice of the same clause when compared with other forms of legislation he was vague and unconvincing didactic and prejudiced if dartrey's object had been to bring these two men into closer understanding of each other he was certainly succeeding it is doubtful however whether the understanding progressed entirely in the fashion he had desired nora curled up in an easy chair affecting to be sleepy but still listening earnestly felt at last that intervention was necessary the self-revelation of miller under tallente's surgical questioning was beginning to disturb even their host i am being neglected she complained if no one talks to me i shall go home tallente rose at once and sat on the lounge by her side dartrey stood on the hearth rug and plunged into an ingenious effort to reconcile various points of difference which had arisen between his two guests tallente all the time was politely acquiescent miller a little sullen like all men with brains acute enough to deal logically with a procession of single problems he resented because he failed altogether to understand that a wider field of circumstances could possibly alter human vision tallente walked home with nora they chose the longer way by the embankment this is the cockney's antithesis to the moonlight and hills of you country folk nora observed as she pointed to the yellow lights flashing across the black water tallente drew a long breath of content it's good to be here anyway i am glad to be out of that house he confessed i am afraid she sighed that our dear host's party was a failure you and miller were born in different camps of life it doesn't seem to me that anything will ever bring you together for this reason tallente explained eagerly miller's outlook is narrow and egotistical he may be a shrewd politician but there isn't a grain of statesmanship in him he might make an excellent chairman of a parish council as a cabinet minister he would be impossible he will demand office i am afraid nora remarked tallente took off his hat he was watching the lights from the two great hotels the red fires from the funnel of a little tug black and mysterious in the windy darkness i am sick of politics he declared suddenly we are a parcel of fools our feet move day and night to the solemn music you of all men she protested to be talking like this i mean it he insisted a little doggedly i have spent too many of my years on the treadmill a man was born to be either an egoist and parcel out the earth according to his tastes or to develop like darkly into a dreamer curse you he added suddenly shaking his fist at the tall towers of the house of the parliament you're like an infernal boarding school with your detentions and impositions and castigations there must be something beyond a cabinet minister she began the sixth form he interrupted there's just one aspiration of life to be granted under that roof and to win it you are asked to stifle all the rest it isn't worth it it's the greatest game at which men can play she declared and also the narrowest because it is the most absorbing he answered we have our triumphs there and they end in a chuckle don't you love sunshine in winter strange cities pictures pictures of another age pictures which take your thoughts back into another world architecture that is not utilitarian the faces of human beings on whom the strain of life has never fallen and women women whose eyes will laugh into yours who haven't a single view in life who don't care a fig about improving their race who want just love to give and to take she gazed at him in astonishment a little carried away her eyes soft her lips parted but you have turned pagan she cried an instant's revolt against the methodism of life he replied his feet once more upon the earth but the feelings there all the same he went on doggedly i want to leave school i have been there so long it seems to me my holiday is overdue 
she passed her arm through his she was a very clever and a very understanding woman that comes of your having ignored us she murmured it isn't my fault if i have he reminded her in a sense it is she insisted the woman in your life should be the most beautiful part of it you chose to make her the stepping-stone to your ambition consequently you go through life hungry you wait till you almost starve and then suddenly the greatest things in the world which lie to your hand seem like bottles you are hideously logical he grumbled they were walking slower now within a few yards of the entrance to her flat both of them were a little disturbed she full as she was with all the generous impulses of sensuous humanity intensely awakened intensely sympathetic tell me where is your wife she asked in america it is hopeless with her utterly and irretrievably hopeless it has been for long for years and for the sake of your principles she went on almost angrily your stupid canonical and dry as dust little principles you've let your life shrivel up i can't help it he answered what would you have me do stand in the marketplace and shout my needs she clung to his arm you dear thing she said you're a great baby they were in the shadow of the entrance to the flats he suddenly bent over her his lips were almost on hers there was a frightened gleam in her eyes but she made no movement of retreat suddenly he drew himself upright that wouldn't help would it he said simply thank you all the same nora good-bye on his table when he entered his rooms that night lay the letter for which he had craved he opened it almost fiercely the few lines seemed like a message of hope don't laugh at me dear friend but i am coming to london for a week or two to my little house in charles street i don't know exactly when you will find time to come and see me here the mist seemed to have fallen upon us like a shroud and we can't escape i galloped many miles this morning but it was like trying to find the edge of the world please call on my sister at seventeen mount street she likes you and wants to see more of you jane End of chapter twenty Chapter Twenty One of Nobody's Man by E. Phillips Oppenheim. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Seven. For some weeks after his chief's dinner party, Talent slackened a little in his grim devotion to work. A strangely quiescent period of day by day political history enabled him to be absent from his place in the house for several evenings during the week and although he spent a good many hours with dartrey at demos house carefully discussing and elaborating next season's program he still found himself with time to spare and with jane's note buttoned up in his pocket he deliberately turned his face towards life in its more genial and human aspect he dined one night at the club to which he had belonged for many years a club frequented chiefly by distinguished literary men successful barristers and a sprinkling of actors his arrival created at first almost a sensation a slight feeling of constraint even amongst the little gathering of men drinking their aperitifs in the lounge under the stairs somehow or other there was a feeling that many of the old ties had been broken talent stood for new and menacing things in politics he had to a certain extent cut himself adrift from the world which starts at eton and at oxford and ends by making mild puns on the judicial bench or uttering sonorous platitudes from a properly accredited seat in the house fully appreciating the atmosphere nevertheless made strenuous and not unsuccessful efforts to pick up the old threads he abandoned even the moderation of his daily life he drank cocktails champagne and port laughed heartily at the stories of the day and ransacked his brain to cap them of bridge unfortunately he knew nothing but he played pool with some success and left the club late leaving behind him curiously mingled opinions as to the cause for this sudden return to his old haunts he himself walked through the streets on his way homeward 
conscious of at least partial success feeling the pleasurable warmth of the wine he had drunk and the companionship for which he had so strenuously sought he found himself thinking almost enviously of the men with whom he had associated philipson with whom he had been at college with three plays running at different theatres interested even fascinated by his work chaffing gaily with his principal actor as to the rendering of some of his lines then there was fardell also a schoolfellow now a police magistrate full of dry and pleasant humour called by his intimates the beak amberson poseur and dilettante thirty years ago but always a good fellow now an acknowledged master of english prose and a critic whose word was unquestioned these men one and all seemed to be up to the neck in life kept young and human by the taste of it upon their palate the contemplation of their whole-sided existence their sound combination of work and play produced in him a sort of jealousy for he knew that there was something behind it which he lacked the night was bright and dry and there were still crowds about leicester square piccadilly circle and piccadilly itself as he walked he looked into the faces of the women who passed him by struggling against his old abhorrence as against one of the sickly offshoots of an over-eclectic epicureanism they typified not vice but weakness the unhappy result of man's inevitable revolt against unnatural laws yet even then the mingled purity and priggishness encouraged by years of repression forbade any vital change in his sentiments the toleration for which he sought when it made its grudging appearance was mingled with dislike and distrust he breathed more freely as he turned into the quieter street in which his rooms were situated passing them by however crossing Curzon street and embarking upon a brief pilgrimage which had become almost a nightly one within a very few minutes he paused before a certain number in a street even more secluded than his own at last the thing which he had so greatly anticipated had happened there were lights in the house from top to bottom jane had arrived he walked slowly back and forth several times the music in his blood stirred already by the wine he had drunk and the revival of old memories moved to a new and more wonderful tune he knew now without any possibility of self-deception exactly what he had been waiting for exactly where all his thoughts and hopes for the future were centred was she there now he wondered gazing at the windows like a moonstruck boy he lingered about and fate was kind to him a limousine swung around the corner and pulled up in front of the door a few minutes later the footman on the box sprang down he heard her voice as she said good-bye to someone the car rolled smoothly away she crossed the pavement with an involuntary glance at the tall approaching figure jane he exclaimed she stood quite still with a latch-key in her hand the car was out of sight now and they seemed to be almost alone in the street at first there was something almost unfamiliar in her rather startled face her coiffured hair her bare neck with its collar of diamonds there was a moment of suspense then he saw something flash into her eyes and he was glad to be there you she exclaimed a little breathlessly he plunged into explanations my rooms are close by here in charges street he told her i was walking home from the club and saw you step out of the car how could you know that i was coming to-day she asked i only telephoned alice after i arrived to tell you the truth he confessed i have got into the habit of walking this way home in case well to-night i have my reward she turned the key in the latch and pushed the door open you must come in she invited isn't it too late what does that matter so long as i ask you he followed her gladly into the hall closing the door behind him that wretched switch is somewhere near here she said feeling along the wall her fingers suddenly met his and stayed passive in his grasp she turned a little around as she realized the nearness of him jane he whispered i have wanted you so much for a single moment she rested in his arms a wonderful moment 
inexplicable voluptuous stirring him to the very depths then she slipped away her finger sought the wall once more and the place was flooded with light you must come in here for a moment she said opening the nearest door i shall not ask you to share my milk and i am afraid i don't know where to get you a whiskey and soda but you can light a cigarette and just tell me how things are and when you are coming to see me he followed her into a comfortable little apartment furnished in mid-victorian fashion but with an easy chair drawn up to the brightly burning fire on a table near was a glass of milk and some biscuits the ermine cloak slipped from her shoulders she stood with one foot upon the fender half turned towards him his eyes rested upon her filled with a great hunger well she queried you are wonderful he murmured she laughed and for a moment her eyes fell but my dear man she said i don't want compliments i want to know the news there is none he answered we are marking time while horlock digs his own grave you have been amusing yourself indifferently i dined the other night with dartrey to-night at the sheridan club the most exciting thing in the twenty-four hours has been my nightly pilgrimage round here how idiotic she laughed supposing you had not happened to meet me you could scarcely have rung my bell at this hour of the night i should have been content to have seen the lights and to have known that you had arrived you dear man she exclaimed with a sudden smile a smile of entire and sweet friendliness i like the thought of your doing that it is something to know that one is welcome when one breaks away from the routine of one's life as i have tell me why you have done it he asked she looked back into the fire everything was going a little wrong she explained one of my farmers was troublesome and the snow had stopped work and hunting we lost thirty of our best ewes last week i found i was getting out of temper with everybody and everything so i suddenly remembered that i had an empty house here and came up to the city of adventures he murmured she shrugged her shoulders london has never seemed like that to me i find it generally a very ugly and a very sordid place where i am hedged in with relatives generally wanting me to do the thing i loathe you have really no news for me then none except that i am glad to see you when will you come and have a long talk will you dine with me to-morrow night he begged eagerly in the afternoon i have committee meetings thursday afternoon you could come down to the house if you cared to of course i should but hadn't you better dine here she suggested i can ask alice and another man i want to see you alone he insisted for the first time at any rate then will you take me to that little place you told me of in soho she suggested i don't want a whole crowd to know that i am in town just yet don't think that it sounds vain but people have such a habit of almost carrying one off one's feet i want to prowl about london and do ordinary things one or two theatres perhaps but no dinner parties i shan't stay long i don't suppose as soon as i hear from mr segerson that the snow has gone and that terrible north wind has died away i know i shall be wanting to get back you are very conscientious about your work there he complained don't you ever realize that you may have an even more important mission here for a single moment she seemed troubled her manner when she spoke had lost something of its calm graciousness really she said well you must tell me all about it to-morrow night i shall wear a hat and you must not order the dinner beforehand i don't mind your ordering the table because i like a corner but we must sail into the place just like any other two wanderers it is agreed he bent over her fingers his good angel and his instinct of sensibility which was always appraising her attitude towards him prompted his study farewell you will let yourself out she begged i have taken off my cloak and i could not face that wind of course he answered i shall call for you at a quarter to eight to-morrow night i only wish i could make you understand what it means to have that to look forward to if you can make me believe that she answered gravely perhaps i shall be glad that i have come End of chapter 21
Chapter Twenty Two of Nobody's Man by E. Phillips Oppenheim. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Twenty Two. Whilst Talent rejuvenated and with a wonderful sense of well-being at the back of his mind was on his feet in the house of commons on the following afternoon leading an unexpected attack against the unfortunate government dartrey sat at tea in nora's study nora who had had a very busy day was leaning back in her chair well content though a little fatigued dartrey who had forgotten his lunch in the stress of work was devoting himself to the muffins while i think of it he said let me thank you for playing hostess so charmingly the other night she made him a little bow your dinner party was a great success wasn't he murmured a little doubtfully i am not quite so sure i can't seem to get a talent somehow he is doing his work well isn't he the mechanical side of it is most satisfactory dartrey confessed he is the most perfect parliamentary machine that was ever evolved surely that is exactly what you want you were always complaining that there was no one to bring the stragglers into line for the present dartrey admitted talent is doing excellently i wish though that i could see a little farther into the future tell me exactly what fault you find with him nora persisted he lacks enthusiasm already he makes none of the mistakes which are coincident with genius and he is a little intolerant he takes no trouble to adapt himself to varying views he has a fine broad outlook but no man can see into every corner of the earth and what is outside his outlook does not exist anything else he is not happy in his work there is something wanting in his scheme of life i have built a ladder for him to climb i have given him the chance of becoming the greatest statesman of to-day one would think that he had some other ambition nora sighed she looked across at her visitor a little diffidently i can help you to understand andrew tallant she declared his condition is the greatest of all tributes to my sex he has had an unhappy married life from forty to fifty he has borne it philosophically as a man may now the reaction has come with the first dim approach of age he becomes suddenly terrified for the things he is missing dartrey was thoughtful i dare say you are right he admitted but if he needs an aspasia surely she could be found nora rested her head upon her fingers she seemed to be watching intently the dancing flames her broad womanly forehead was troubled her soft brown eyes pensive he is fifty years old she said it is rather an anomalous age at fifty a man's taste is almost hypercritical and his attraction to my sex is on the wane no the problem isn't so easy dartrey had finished tea and was feeling for a cigarette case i rather fancied nora that he was attracted by you well he isn't then she replied with a smile he was rather by way of thinking that he was the other night but that was simply because he was in a curiously unsettled state and he felt that i was sympathetic you are a very clever woman nora he said looking across at her you could make him care for you if you chose is that to be my sacrifice to the cause she asked am i to give my soul to its wrong keeper that our party may flourish you don't like talent i like him immensely she contradicted vigorously if i weren't hopelessly in love with some one else i could find it perfectly easy to try and make life a different place for him he looked at her with trouble in his kind eyes it was as though he had suddenly stumbled upon a tragedy i have never guessed this about you nora he murmured you are not observant of small things she answered a little bitterly who is the man that i shall not tell you do i know him less i should say than any one of your acquaintance he was silent for a moment or two then it chanced that the telephone rang for him with a message from the house of commons he gave some instructions to his secretary it is a queer thing he remarked as he replaced the receiver how far our daily work 
and our ambitions take us out of our immediate environment i see you day by day nora i have known you intimately since your school days and i never guessed you never guessed and i have no time to suffer she answered so we go on until the breaking time comes until one part of ourselves conquers and the other loses it is rather like that just now with andrew tallente a few more years and it will probably be like that with me he threw his cigarette away as though the flavor had suddenly become distasteful and sat drumming with his fingers upon the table his eyes fixed upon nora tallente's position he said thoughtfully one can understand he is married isn't he and with all the splendid breadth of his intellectual outlook he is still harassed by the social fetters of his birth and bringing up i can conceive tallente as a person too high-minded to seek to evade the law and too scornful for intrigue but you nora how is it that your love brings you unhappiness you are young and free and surely he concluded with a little sigh when you choose you can make yourself irresistible she looked at him with a peculiar light in her eyes i have proved myself very far from being irresistible she declared the man for whose love my whole being is aching to-day is absolutely unawakened as to my desirability i enjoy with him the most impersonal friendship in which two people of opposite sexes ever indulged i thought that i was acquainted with all your intimates dartrey observed in a puzzled tone let me meet this man and judge for myself nora do you mean that she asked certainly very well then she acquiesced i'll take him to dinner here when are you free he glanced through a thin memorandum book on sunday night at eight o'clock she said you won't mind a simple dinner i know i can promise you that you will be interested my friend is worth knowing dartrey took his departure a little hurriedly he had suddenly remembered an appointment at his committee rooms and went off with his mind full of the troubles of a northern constituency on his way up parliament street he met miller who turned and walked by his side heard the news the latter asked curtly no is there any was the quick reply talents broken the truce miller announced there was rather an acid debate on the compensation clauses of pensions allotment bill talent pulled them to pieces and then challenged a division the government whips were barely caught napping and were beaten by twelve votes dartrey's eyes flashed talent is a most wonderful tactician he said this is the second time he's forced the government into a hole horlick will never last the session at this rate there are rumors of a resignation of course miller went on but they aren't likely to go out on a snatched division like this we don't want them to dartrey agreed all the time though this sort of thing is weakening their prestige we shall be ready to give them their coup de grace in about four months the two men were silent for a moment then miller spoke again a little abruptly i can't seem to get on with talent he confessed i am sorry dartrey regretted you will have to try miller we can't do without him try i have tried was the impatient rejoinder talent may have his points but nature never meant him to be a people's man he's too hidebound in convention and tradition upon my soul dartrey he makes me feel like a republican of the bloodthirsty age he's so blasted superior you're going back to the smaller outlook miller his chief expostulated these personal prejudices should be entirely negligible i am perfectly certain that talent himself would lay no stress upon them stress upon them damn it i'm as good as he is miller exclaimed irritably there is no harm in talent's ratting quitting his order and coming amongst us democrats but what i do object to is his bringing the mannerisms and outlook of eton and oxford amongst us when i am with him he always makes me feel that i am doing the wrong thing and that he knows it dartrey frowned a little impatiently this is rubbish miller he pronounced it is you who are to blame for attaching the slightest importance to these trifles trifles miller growled 
within a very short time dartrey this question will have to be settled does tallente know that i am promised a seat in his cabinet i think that he must surmise it the sooner he knows the better miller declared acidly tallente can unbend all right when he likes he was dining at the trocadero the other night with brooks and ainley and parker and saunderson the most cheerful party in the place tallente seemed to have slipped out of himself and yet there isn't one of those men who has ever had a day's schooling or has ever worn anything but ready-made clothes he leaves his starch off when he's with them what's the matter with me i should like to know i'm a college man even though i did go as an exhibitioner i was a school-teacher when those fellows were wielding pickaxes dartrey looked at his companion thoughtfully for a single moment the words trembled upon his lips which would have brought things to an instant and profitless climax then he remembered the million or so of people of miller's own class and way of thinking to whom he was a leading light and he choked back the words i find this sort of conversation a little peevish miller he said as soon as any definite difference of opinion arises between you and tallente i will intervene at present you are both doing good work our cause needs you both you won't forget how i stand miller persisted as they reached their destination no one has ever yet accused me of breaking my word was a somewhat chilly rejoinder you shall have your pound of flesh End of chapter 22